Now, shall we read together in the book of Job and in chapter 28? Job 28, and we'll read together at verse 7. There is a path which no fowl knoweth, the vulture's eye hath not seen, The lion's whelps have not trodden it, nor the fierce lion passed by it. Now over to the Psalms, and in 91, Psalm 91, he that dwelleth, In the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. And the last reading in the Psalms and in chapter 77. Psalm 77, we'll read there at verse 19. Thy way is in the sea, and thy path in the great waters, and thy footsteps are not known. I want to bring you in spirit this afternoon, at the beginning of a new year, into three different locations. In Job, I want to bring you to a path. And in the Psalms, 91, to a place. And in Psalm 77, to a way. These are three terms with which we are very readily acquainted. I a path, and a place, and a way. But when you turn to the path in Job 28, we discover that this path is not known by any fowl. The vulture's eye has never seen this path, despite the distance that it would travel and the keenness of its eye. The path has never been seen by the fowl. It's never been known by the vulture. The lion's whelps, with all its marauding, haven't trodden it, and the fierce lion has never passed by it. A path unseen by the eye of the greatest of birds, and unknown by the greatest of beasts. To a place, and it's called a secret place. And it's the secret place of the Most High. And in that secret place there is also a shadow. And it's the shadow of the Almighty. An unknown path and a secret place. And then a way which is in the sea. And a path which is in great waters, and footsteps which are not known. Now, as you think of these three different locations, you will see there's a degree of mystery attached to them. Mystique. Unknown. That's exactly like the year that we have now entered. There's none of us knows what a day may bring forth. 
So these sections of scripture, with all their mystery, just would remind us of what lies ahead in this year that we have now entered. But as you think of them, if there is a path which is hidden from the eye of the fowl and the vulture and the lion squelp and the lion, would I not want to walk it? Because we all know the significance of the fowls of the air and we know the spiritual dangers which are posed by the lion. So if this path is hidden from the fowl of the air and unknown to the danger of the lion, would I not want to walk it? When you come to Psalm 91, we discover this, that in the psalm there's all sorts of dangers there. There's the state of the fowler. There's, there's noisome pestilence. There's, there's the pestilence that's in the darkness at night. And there's arrows that fly by noonday. And against all these dangers, there's a place which is a secret place that is designed by God for people like us who are going to face these dangers in 24 to dwell in the secret place and to be hidden under the shadow of the Almighty. So if, if there's a path like there is in Job 20, 28, we need to walk it wherever it is. And if there's a place in the secret of the Most High, we need to find it. And if there's a way that's a deep way, we need to try to walk it. And I would like this afternoon just to try to uncover what is this path? And where is this place? And how can we walk in this way? Now, first of all, I want to remind you of the danger of the fowl. Now, in those days, the word fowl would just be used as a generic term for the birds of the air. So think for a moment of the dangers which are posed to your life and mine by the fowl or the birds of the air. I think we're first introduced to that in the book of Genesis and chapter number 40. Do you remember we're taken into a prison in Egypt and two men have dreamed dreams? The one is a butler and the other is a baker. And both of them dream dreams. And Joseph, the revealer of secrets, is going to just explain to the butler and the baker the meaning of their dreams. Well, says Joseph, for the butler, in the dream there was three branches. And for the baker, in the dream, there was three baskets. Three branches and three baskets. Touching the branches, Joseph says, listen, these branches, they budded. They blossomed. They brought forth grapes. And we know that therefore from that, that the butler, through his dream, his position was going to be recovered and restored and he would go back to being the butler of Pharaoh, but not the baker. Says the word of the baker, on his head there were three baskets, white baskets. And the birds of the air came to the top baskets. And says the baker, they did eat them out of the basket of my head. What had happened? One of these two had tried to poison the king. But the butler, his branches, they budded, they blossomed, they brought forth grapes. But the baker, his mind had been attacked. 
by the birds of the air. Evil influences had entered the mind of the baker. What a note to start our new year. Just to caution us as to the effects of the birds of the air on the minds of the people of God. Do you remember when the apostle wrote to the church in, in, in Colossae, the, the authorized version renders it like this, set your affection, but a better rendering would be set your mind on things above and not on the things of the earth. And there is a cautionary note for all of us today that we might just guard the gate of our mind. There are influences out there and they come in so many different guises and forms. And the object of these evil forces is to attack and pollute and disrupt the mind of the people of God. And so maybe a cautionary warning from the basket of the baker to just be careful of evil influences that can affect our mind. Then secondly, do you remember in Matthew chapter 13, a sower went forth to sow. And he just did what any sower did. They just sowed the seed. That's what the word of God says. In the morning, sow thy seed. In the evening, withhold not thy hand. I think that's also the meaning of the, of the verse. Cast thy bread upon the water. Just let the seed grow. Go and grow. And thou shalt find it after many days. And the sower goes forth. And he sows the seed. Now we'll take it that the seed is the word of God. You may see it as a seed kingdom. And I'm happy with that. But we'll take it just for this purpose. As the word of God. And what happens? As soon as you see the, word, the seed of the word of God being sown, there are evil influences out there that just want to pluck the seed from the wayside. I say this to you. Over this weekend of meetings, and, maybe to, and tomorrow too, I'm sure, the word of God will be taught, and into all of our minds will be planted the good seed of the word of God. And we're surrounded by those of like minds. And it's lovely to sing these lovely hymns. Can I say this to you? That there will be a concentrated effort from the ranks of the evil one to just pluck the seed of the word of God from our minds. Lest it graduate into a challenge for our hearts. And we leave places like this with a greater determination to be something more for God. There's a force out there. And their objective is just to pluck the good seed of the word of God implanted in our minds and hearts and rob us of the spiritual potential that we could be in our lives for God. The fowls came and devoured the seed so it attacks the mind of the baker and it devours the seed that's been sown. But then thirdly, says the word of God, there's a grain of mustard seed. And it grows into a great tree. And this time, the fowls of the air are the objective with them for the, for the mustard tree of the mustard seed tree is not to destroy it or to pluck it, but to dwell within it. And I think you will find a similarity. I'm not saying they're all the same. But I think there's a similarity and a synergy between the great tree and the great house of 2 Timothy 2 and the great city of Revelation chapter 18. A great tree and in this tree you'll find that these fowls are quite content just to live in it. I think it represents 
apostate Christendom, the existence of religious orders in which there's nothing of God. But the birds of the air are quite content to dwell in the branches of this great tree. And the unclean vessels are quite happy to be in the great house. And all manner of evils are happy to exist in the great city. I would suggest to you the fowl and the vulture represent the forces of evil that surround us as the people of God. But then secondly, not only is there the fowl and the vulture, but there's the lion. Now you then ask the question, well, how, how would I, or why would I be attacked by the lion? Do you remember this? God raised up a man called Samson. And he was raised up by God to be a Nazarite. And he's just started off in his life as a Nazarite. And he's met by the lion. You say to me, well, is this what I should expect as I start off? Well, wait a moment. There's a qualifying factor in this. Can I remind you of where Samson met the lion? It was in the vineyards of Timnath. You say, where? The vineyards of Timnath. But you see, Samson was a Nazarite. As part of Samson's Nazarite vow, he wasn't to touch anything from the kernel to the husk. Why was a no-go? And yet he finds himself in the vineyards of Timnath. And in the vineyards of Timnath, Samson met the lion. You know, if you, were, if you were in the vineyards of Timnath yourself, and you were to meet Samson, you'd have said to Samson, what are you doing here? You're a Nazarite. And you've got to touch anything from the kernel to the husk. And yet here we find you. You'd almost be astonished that you find a Nazarite in the vineyards of Timnath. I wonder, as we look back upon our lives in the last year, would that finger be pointed at any of our lives? What are you doing here? You see, if we as those who are desirous to be marked by separation find ourselves in places which essentially are like the vineyards of Timnath, which essentially are places where we risk being compromised, then understand this. You're at risk of facing the lion. Sometimes we might say of ourselves, we're not in a good place. Sometimes that's not always because of disobedience. Circumstances of life can be like that. But I would say this to you, that if we choose to enter the vineyards of Timnath, then we risk facing the lion. Now in the goodness of God, through God's Spirit, Samson receives strength and without even breaking sweat, he dealt with the lion. But he should never have been there in the first place. Now think of this. He's another young man. He's a prophet. And it wouldn't be stretching it too far to say, this is a young man, this is a young man of a bit of gift. He both knew the word of God and he could handle the word of God. And he was given a command, go to this place and give your word and don't socialize, just return. He was a young prophet. And in this prophet, young prophet, there was a vast life of potential for God. 
There came into his life an older prophet. And watch this. The older prophet says this, I am a prophet. That was true. But he also added something that wasn't true. He says, as thou art. That wasn't true. Because the young man was a prophet who was in touch with God. And there was an old man who was a prophet out of touch with God. Now, you know yourself. And there are older believers in the hall today. And on the platform, we'll associate with them for a moment. We'd all tell you this. As older people who have grown up in the things of God. And have been in the assembly for many years. It's very easy. To get out of touch with God. Very easy. And it can affect your movements. And it can affect your thoughts. And it can affect your behaviour. And it can even infiltrate your ministry. And when you're ministering the word of God. If you're not in touch with God. You're a dangerous commodity. Because you could offend. And say things in the wrong way. And just vent the flesh under the camouflage. Of pretending to be teaching God's word. And the, the young prophet came under the influence of this older prophet. You'd have thought, well, surely he'd benefit from his experience. Experienced as an older man will only be of benefit if we're in touch with God. And as a result of that, this young prophet was distracted from what? From just doing what God said. I say this to you. That as a younger person, you will read your Bible. And you will form convictions. And you'll get to know God and you'll get to know his word. And you will benefit from the ministry of many of the brethren that teach us. We're grateful to the Lord for them. But just be careful. Who you allow into your life. It can twist your mind. And distract you from divine purpose. And the young prophet, who was moving in the way that God had intended for him, because of the fact he allowed himself to be influenced by an older prophet out of touch with God. The word of God says this, a lion met him in the way. Now come to another old man. And he's writing his epistle. And he says this, and you can, feel, you, can feel the, you can feel the weight of experience coming through when he says this. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, goeth about seeking whom he may devour. And you say to Peter, how do you know that? He would say, I, I was there. I experienced it. Now you say, tell me this, how was it possible? We, we, understood, we, understand, we understand that Samson faced the lion because he was in the vineyards of Timnath. He was compromising his separation. And we understand that the young prophet, he faced the lion because he, he went from being obedient to God's word to being disobedient to God's word. And he went out of the way of divine instruction. What about Peter? Says the word of God. He stood with them by the fire, warming himself despite the warning, Satan hath put out a request for thee, that he may sift thee as wheat. But I have prayed for thee. And in the judgment, in the in the judgment hall, Peter, rather than standing in allegiance. And loyalty to the Savior, he stood with them by the fire. You know what? You know what happened? He used language that was contrary to his character. Out of his mouth came things that you wouldn't normally hear Peter saying. And he denied what he knew to be true. Surely thou wast one of them. And then, listen to this. I know not the man. Oh, you see, I'm horrified. 
I say this to you. Have we ever been in a place or conducted ourselves in a manner that has said, in effect, I'm not of this man. Peter says, will you be sober? Will you be vigilant? Because your answer to the devil as a roaring lion goes about seeking whom be devoured. Now these are three people who faced lions. And they should never have faced them. Because they were in the wrong place. Let me just tell you two people that faced lions because they were in the right place. Benaiah. He went into a pit. The best translation I've seen of that pit is the Jerusalem Bible. It says this. Benaiah went into a cistern. Now that starts to make sense to us, doesn't it? He have hewn out cisterns. Broken cisterns which contain no water. Benaiah said, if, I, if that lion remains in that pit, the people of God are going to be starved of the refreshment of water. And you know all that water represents. He said, I'm going to deal with that. And there are times when we have to positively and deliberately go into the sphere of the lion and beard the lion in the sphere of the cistern so the people of God will have water. And you know the, you know the other. It says the word of God. Daniel opened his windows three times a day towards Jerusalem and prayed unto his God as he had done a four time. And you know he was placed in the den of lions and feared no danger. Little wonder he wrote these lovely words. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and shall do exploits. So you see, well, I understand that I want, to, I want to be in this path because it will protect me from the attack of the vulture and it will protect, protect me from the attack of the lion. But where is the path? Well, you know, you only just read down the chapter. Job 28 it will surprise you if you haven't read it before. Maybe you have. But it's a chapter about mining. Imagine speaking about mining in Kirkcaldy. There are millions of tons of fossil fuels that God has provided that we no longer seem to want to use. There's a point. And he says this, there's something that will never be found by the mining of for, for gold or silver or stones. And it's this. It's wisdom. So the Spirit of God through this verse and through this chapter is just going to pose the question, in that case, where shall wisdom be found? Says Job, God understandeth the way thereof. There it is. God knows it. And God understandeth the path thereof. And the path that's hidden from the vulture and the lion is the path of wisdom. Now, you just let your mind go down this track and you can enjoy it in your own soul. It says Colossians 2, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom. Think of, think of James 3. The wisdom which is from above is first Pure. And here's young people, and some of you are in relationships, and maybe you'll be getting married the next year, or you're hoping to be married in the next few years, and here's the word of God where it says, through wisdom, wisdom, wisdom is on house builded. And by understanding it's established, and by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all pleasant riches. And need I remind you of this? There will come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. And a branch shall grow forth out of its roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And says the word of God. The spirit of wisdom. True wisdom is to be found alone in Christ. Now second I want to bring you today. Now, 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 not, not, not to the path. But I want you to bring you to a place. And it's a secret place. Now every child of God in this company today should want to get to that secret place for this reason alone. And there's other reasons. Because, watch the titles of God. These four 
key titles or names of God used in the Old Testament. It's the secret place of number one, the Most High. Number two, the shadow of the Almighty, El Shaddai, the all-sufficient God. You've got a supreme God, the Most High, and El Shaddai, an all-sufficient God. I will say of the Lord, the Lord Jehovah, my God, my Elohim, in whom will I trust. So that in this secret place is the Most High, El Shaddai, the Lord Jehovah, and God Elohim. Now again, why would you want to be in this place? Because of this. In the chapter, verse 2, the snare of the fowler. Verse 3, the noise and petulance, pestilence. Verse 5, the terror by night. Verse 5 again, the arrow by noonday. Verse 6, the pestilence that walketh in darkness. Verse 6, the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Now, notice these couplets. The secret place of the Most High, shadow of the Almighty. Secret place and shadow. There's the first couplet. Second couplet, steer of the fowler, and noise and pestilence. There's the second couplet. Third couplet, terror by night, arrow by noonday. Verse 5. Verse 6. Pestilence that walketh in darkness. Verse 6. The destruction that wasteth at noonday. So you've got one couplet. The Most High and the Shadow of the Almighty. And that is the protecting factor for these other three couplets that present challenges for us as the people of God. Now, for the sake of time, let me just say this. It's near of the fowl. That's hidden things. You'll never see it until you're on it. The adversary is just like that. Hidden dangers. Noise and pestilence, just like the plagues of Egypt. Just difficulties all around. In the night, in the day. In the darkness, in the noonday. In the darkness... These things that just can be intensely practical. These things that, of which you see, I, I just couldn't sleep last night. You been there? The, the, isn't it interesting that when we get tired and we need to sleep, that our worries just seem to compound? The darkness. And then you see. Not only am I worried in the night time, but there's just so many attacks seem to be on the noonday. It's almost as if you never... Do you ever go out on a day and you... Do you ever go out on a day ever and find there's nothing to distract you spiritually? Foul language, foul conversation, things you see, things you hear. Well, all around us, we never get a break from it. Says the psalmist, here's a place for a break. It's the secret place of the Most High and it's the shadow of the Almighty. Now... Here's, here's what I think. This is, now obviously I read books as you read books and I hear listen to men and, and as you listen to men and, and women and we're very grateful for their help. I would like to submit this to you that some say if there's no author given to the psalm it should be attributed to David. Others will say if there's no authorship to the psalm it should be attributed to the man that speaks before, writes before. Now you know Psalm 90 is written by Moses. Now, if Psalm 91 is also written by Moses, you can see how it falls into place. What's the secret place? Is that not within the veil? In the tabernacle? Into which the high priest went alone once every year. Was it not a secret place? And would the shadow therefore not be the wings of the cherubim that overshadowed the mercy seat? And it starts to allow us to place in our minds a picture of where this place is. And it's the inner sanctum of the presence of God where the general Israelite was never permitted to go. 
Now you say, well, what's the application? I would submit this to you. The application for our day is the place of our daily relationship and daily communion with God. Now, this is a very basic challenge. But I say this to you. 24. The hub of our spiritual development in 24 will be our daily relationship with God. I think the reading of the word of God will help us and the fellowship of God's people will aid us and the, the teaching of the word of God will be a great aid, uh, will, 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 will instruct us and help us. But if there's, if there's missing just that secret place of communion with God, I say this to you, I would even go as far as saying, we'll go nowhere for God in 24 unless we get into the secret place. Now, what do we find in the secret place? First of all, we find the Most High. That first appears in Genesis chapter 14. And isn't it interesting? It's associated with priesthood. Priest of the Most High God. I thought that was touching. There's a man at God's right hand who has been the way before us and understands, understands where we are and, and he's, he's a sympathetic priest at God's right hand. And the first title is the Most High God. And your Jack Hunter, you hear me quoting him many times. He, he was a great help to me. Jack Hunter used to say to us, how well do you know God? How well do you know God? Well, he's the most high God, meaning that there will be no other pinnacle in my life. There will be no higher authority in my life. There will be no higher influence in my life than the most high. And then if I, if I, if I dwell in the secret place of the most high, I will abide. There will just be a shadow, great study of scripture. Great shadow. <clears throat> The shadow of the Almighty, and the Almighty is the all-sufficient one. There is the, the God that we are going to serve in 24. There's no lack with him. There is no, there's no depletion of his resources. I don't know how many are in this hall, but we probably all prayed today. We all asked God. We prayed in the back hall before the conference started, and we're always asking God. And yet, aren't you just delighted that the, the, the resources of God are never depleted through our much asking? He's El Shaddai. He's the all-sufficient God. There was a man who used to be in the assembly here called G.R. Rolo. And he, he called it like this. He says, El Shaddai is the God who is enough. The God who is enough. And if you have this God, you need nothing more and no one more than him. The, the Most High and El Shaddai, the shadow of the Almighty, I will see of the Lord, Jehovah, the covenant-keeping one. He's never... He's never let us down. We might not understand the way he's leading, but he's always kept to his word. And he's the Elohim, the Father, and the Son, and the Spirit, the triune God. And we're encouraged in Psalm 90 just to get into the secret place of the Most High and to abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And when we do, what do you find within the ark? Tables of the covenant. Golden pot that had manna. Aaron's rod that budded. Tables of the covenant. There was one who came into time. He said, this law I come in the volume of the book. I know it's wider than that. The volume of the book, it is written of me. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. And the golden pot that had manna, there will always be feeding for God's people in the secret place of God's presence. And Aaron's rod that budded, there was something of fruitfulness. That's what we want. Deadness brought to life. Aaron's rod that budded. We find that in the secret place of the Most High and abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, five minutes, I'm finished. <clears throat> Thy ways in the sea. Another translation comes up like this The way through the sea is a pathway new one knew was there. And his footsteps were not. Feasible. Let me just take you, in closing, to see experiences of Scripture. And they come to the banks of the Red Sea, just out of Egypt. You see, why did God take them to a sea? Because he was going to take them through it 
and enclosed the sea so they couldn't go back to Egypt. When God saved our soul, he had no intention that we should ever go back to Egypt. But he comes to the sea and he says this, stand still. I say this, you'll know it's a most difficult thing in life's crises just to stand still. Then he says to Moses, watch these things. Lift, lift up the rod and stretch forth thy hand. Think of that. Lift up the rod and stretch forth thy hand. Do you remember the last time God spoke to Moses about the rod in his hand? Back in Horeb, at the burning bush. What is that in thine hand? It's a rod. Take your hand and put it into your bosom. Rod and hand. In the rod, God demonstrated his power. In the hand, God demonstrated Moses' weakness, leprous hand. And yet, <coughs> when you come to the banks of the Red Sea, of course, you lift up the rod. <coughs> And then stretch forth thine hand, because the hand was a cleansed hand. And the power of God, seen in the rod, and the cleansed hand of the, ser the servant. And the sea opened up, and the people went through on dry land. And then you read in the Hebrew epistle, the Egyptians are saying to do were drowned. Now, why do I, why do I, why does the word of God put these things in? Because I need to understand this. You will never accomplish spiritual results by natural means. It's very simple. They thought they could just go through the, like the Israelites. See, if you're not covered by blood and separated by God, you will be like the Egyptians. You'll never be able to make the journey. I do trust you're saved, genuinely saved. If you're not, you will never accomplish anything for God. And of course, when they were safely over the other side, God closed the sea and taught us this, amongst the many lessons, that when God takes us out of Egypt, he never intends us to go back. So we're delivered through the sea in the people of, the people of Israel. What about Jonah? It wasn't deliverance. For Jonah, it was discipline. And isn't it lovely that before God exercised his discipline upon Jonah, he prepared the fish to swallow him up. Isn't that lovely? But discipline, but the word of the Lord is going to come unto Jonah. The second, there's always a second chance with God. Always. Maybe you look at your life, you say, I've just missed, I've just missed it, I've messed it up. 23 has not been a good year. Listen, there's always a second opportunity with God. Deliverance in Israel through the sea, uh, um, uh, discipline in Jonah, in the sea. What about despair? And, and, and says the gospel writer, he left them to the fourth watch of the night. That was the last watch. And sometimes God takes his people and he just, he just pushes them to a point of extremity. And the despair. And out of the despair and the darkness, there's a lovely voice that's heard. It is I. Be not afraid. Maybe 23 has thrown you into many avenues of despair. Just hear that lovely voice of the Savior to your hearts today. It is I. Be not afraid. May God help us in what will be a challenging year just to find the path and, and, and regularly frequent the place and follow the way, that deep way of God in the sea. And may he bless his word to our hearts. Can we thank you, brother Colin, for his ministry?